It has taken decades of relentless investigation, totaling 90,000 individuals, 10,000 interviewed suspects, 4,000 inspected vehicles, 134 people who personally confessed to the crime, and 29 implicated police officers to solve the murder mystery of Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme. Or has it? Although not as well known, Palme's assassination rivals JFK's conspiracy-laden demise 23 years earlier. The two heads of state were adored and equally hated for their progressive views and policies at the time. Was Palmer assassinated by a foreign intelligence agency, or as is the official JFK narrative, by a lone, deranged, attention-seeking gunman? In today's video, we will look at the timeline of Palmer's life, the conspiracies on why someone would want to end it, and what most likely happened in what has been dubbed Europe's JFK. Nineteen twenty seven to nineteen thirty six. Palmer's early years and education. Olaf Palmer was born on January thirtieth, nineteen twenty seven, in Stockholm, Sweden, to a well educated and politically active family. His father, Gunnar Palmer, was a prominent academic and diplomat. Palmer's early exposure to social justice and international affairs discussions shaped his future beliefs. He attended Sigtunerskolen Humanistiska Lärarverket school, where he developed an interest in literature and politics. 1945 to 1951. Palmer's university and political engagement. After military service, Palmer enrolled at the University of Stockholm, studying law and political science. On a scholarship, he also studied at Kenyon College a small liberal art school in central Ohio from 1947 to 1948. During this time, he became involved in various student political organizations, demonstrating a growing commitment to progressive ideals and activism. He also joined the Swedish National Union of Students and where he worked on issues of disarmament and workers' rights. 1953 to 1969. Palmer's Diplomacy and International Relations In 1953, Palmer was recruited by Social Democratic Prime Minister Targa Erlander to work in his secretariat. From 1955, he was a board member of the Swedish Social Democratic Youth League. In 1957, he was elected as a member of parliament. In the early 1960s, Palmer became a member of the Agency for International Assistance and was responsible for inquiries into assistance to developing countries and educational aid. In 1963, he became a member of the cabinet as minister without portfolio in the cabinet office and retained his duties as a close political advisor to Prime Minister Erlander. In 1965, he became Minister of Communications and in 1967 Minister of Education and Ecclesiastical Affairs followed by becoming the Minister for Education in 1968. When party leader Targa Erlanda stepped down in 1969, Palmer was elected as the new leader by the Social Democratic Party Congress and succeeded Erlanda as Prime Minister. During this period, he advocated for social welfare reforms, affordable housing and environmental protection. His ability to bridge international and national concerns becomes a hallmark of his political career. Palmer was popular among the left, but harshly detested by liberals and conservatives. This was due in part to his international activities, especially those directed against US and Soviet foreign policy, and in part to his aggressive and outspoken debating style. 1969 to 1976, Palmer's progressive policies. Palmer's first tenure as Prime Minister was marked by a series of progressive policy initiatives. His commitment to nuclear disarmament and opposition to the Vietnam War gained him international recognition. 1977 to 1981, Palmer's second term and global advocacy. Palmer was re-elected as Prime Minister in 1977. During this period, he remains an outspoken advocate for social justice 
and human rights on the global stage. On the international scene, Palmer was a widely recognized political figure because of his outspoken views on his harsh and emotional criticism of the United States over the Vietnam War, vocal opposition to the crushing of the Prague Spring by the Soviet Union, criticism of European communist regimes, including labeling the Czechoslovakian regime as the cattle of dictatorship in 1975 his campaign against nuclear weapons proliferation, criticism of the Franco regime in Spain, calling the regime goddamn murderous, his opposition to apartheid, branding it as a particularly gruesome system, and support for economic sanctions against South Africa, political and financial support for the African National Congress, the Palestine Liberation Organization, and the Polisario Front his strong criticism of the Pinochet regime in Chile, his political and financial support for the FMLN-FDR in El Salvador and the FSLN in Nicaragua, and his role as a mediator in the Iran-Iraq war. All of this ensured that Palmer had many powerful opponents and friends in the international arena. 1982 to 1986, Palmer's third term and broader impact on world politics. In 1982, Palmer secured his third term as Prime Minister. He continued championing social and economic equality, focusing on unemployment reduction and income redistribution. Palmer's dedication to peaceful coexistence and conflict resolution leads to his involvement in international mediation efforts, including the Iran-Iraq War and the conflict in Cyprus. On February 28, 1986, Palmer was murdered in the streets of Stockholm. And while his life timeline ended then, Olaf Palmer's influence endures long after his third term. His passionate advocacy for justice, equality and human rights inspires generations of progressive leaders worldwide. His approach of combining domestic and international concerns remains a model for effective governance and his legacy continues to shape Swedish and global politics. Palmer's assassination is a breeding ground for countless conspiracy theories and alleged accountable parties. Palmer's politics were far from popular to the many regimes and ideologies he had criticized, which only fueled the fire of the conspiracy rumor mill. Palmer and the PKK When the Turkish Republican was founded on October 29, 1923, Sweden was the first Scandinavian state to recognize the Ankara government, and the two countries ratified a friendship agreement in Turkey's capital just one year later. These cordial relations, primarily founded on the common threat of Russia, were a continuance of Sweden's and the Ottoman Empire's strategic ties. This all changed when Enver Atta and Samir Gungo were assassinated in Sweden in 1984 and 1985 at the behest of PKK leader Abdullah Öcalan, who was captured by Turkey in 1999 and sentenced to life in prison. These assassinations caused Palmer and the Scandinavian nation to realize that the PKK also posed a threat to Sweden and the group was designated as a terrorist organization. Hussein Yidirim, who oversaw the PKK's European affiliates at the time, would then threaten the Swedish government and demanded that the organization be delisted. In 1999, Samdin Sakik, a prominent PKK commander and brother of Kurdish politician Siri Sakik, stated that the PKK was responsible for Palmer's murder. In 1999, Abdullah Öcalan told the Turkish court that his ex-wife's dissident group may have been accountable for Palmer's murder. However, the PKK's involvement has never been established, and recent investigations have cast doubt on the theory. Roberto Tiemi was behind Palmer's assassination. Swedish journalist Anders Leopold argues in his 2008 book The Swedish Tree Shall Be Brought Down, that Roberto Tiemi, a Chilean fascist, murdered Palme. 
Patria e Libertà was a political movement in Chile on the extreme right, supported by the CIA, and Yeme was the leader of the most radical part of that organization. According to Leopold, Palme was murdered because he had granted asylum to a large number of Chilean leftists following the 1973 rebellion that toppled Salvador Allende. In June 1973, Tieme participated in the abortive coup attempt known as the Tacuatazo, after which he staged his death in an aircraft accident and fled to the isolated colony of Colonia Dignidad. Colonia Dignidad was founded by former Nazis in post-World War II Chile and became notorious for the internment, torture and murder of dissidents during the military dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet in the 1970s, while under the leadership of German emigrant preacher and convicted paedophile Paul Schaefer. The apartheid intelligence services killed Palmer. On February 21, 1986, a week before his death, Palmer delivered the keynote address at the Swedish People's Parliament against apartheid, which was held in Stockholm and was attended by hundreds of anti-apartheid sympathizers as well as leaders and officials from the ANC and the anti-apartheid movement. Palmer stated in his address, Apartheid cannot be reformed, it must be abolished. Colonel Eugene de Kock, also known as Prime Evil, a former South African hit squad police officer, testified at the Supreme Court in Pretoria in September 1996, alleging that Palmer had been shot and killed because he strongly opposed the apartheid regime and Sweden made substantial contributions to the ANC. De Kock continued by claiming that he knew Palmer's killer. He asserted it was former police colleague and South African agent Craig Williamson. A few days later, retired police captain Dirk Coetzee, who had previously worked with Williamson, identified Anthony White as Palmer's killer. White was a former Rhodesian cellar scout with ties to South African security services. Interrogated in Mozambique by local South African, TRC and Swedish authorities, White insisted he was not involved in the Palmer assassination. He maintained that his spying role had been wholly mundane, but circumstantial evidence emerged that he had been in Stockholm when Palmer was killed. The gun that had killed the Swedish Premier was also a 357 Magnum revolver, which White favoured. The assassin was then identified as Swedish mercenary Bertil Wedin, who has lived in northern Cyprus since 1985, by former police lieutenant Peter Caselton, who had worked undercover for Williamson. Swedish police investigators travelled to South Africa the following month, in October 1996, but could find no evidence to support de Kock's claims. A 2007 book suggested that a high-ranking civil cooperation bureau agent, Athol Visser, or Ivan the Terrible, was responsible for planning and carrying out the assassination. Tommy Lindstrom, the director of Swedish CID at the time of the assassination, appeared as a guest on the September 8, 2010 episode of Efterlist. When queried by host Hasa Aro who he believed was responsible for the assassination of the Prime Minister, Lindstrom unhesitatingly identified apartheid South Africa as the leading suspect. And the reason for this, according to him, was to end the covert payments made by the Swedish government through Switzerland to the African National Congress. Conspiracies aside, what most likely happened in the assassination of Olaf Palme? Even though he was Prime Minister, Palmer tried to live as low-key as possible. He frequently went out without a bodyguard, and the night he was murdered was no exception. On February 28, 1986, around midnight, while walking home from the Grand Cinema with his wife Lizbeth, the couple was attacked by a lone assailant. Palmer was mortally struck from close range in the back. A second bullet struck Mrs. Palmer. According to the police, a taxi driver used his mobile radio to raise the alarm, and two girls in a nearby vehicle attempted to help. On March 1, 1986, Palmer was officially declared dead upon arrival at the Sabatsberg Hospital. 
The only forensic evidence left by the assassin was two Winchester Western 357 Magnum 158 grain metal penetrating bullets. There were many witnesses to the assassination, and over 25 came forward to the police. Witnesses described the perpetrator as a man between 30 and 50, approximately 5 foot 11 to 6 foot 1 tall, and wearing a dark windbreaker or coat. Numerous witnesses initially described the killer's movements as fluid, effective, and potent, but none of them could recall the killer's face in detail. A week after the murder, a police sketch of the alleged assailant was extensively disseminated in the media, resulting in a massive influx of reports from the public. However, it was later determined that the witness on whose statement the sketch was based had not seen the actual assailant. A journalist and investigator, Thomas Petterschamp, published a series of articles in the Swedish magazine Filter and a book titled The Unlikely Assassin in 2018, based on a lengthy investigation into Palmer's assassination. According to Petterschamp, Palmer was shot by Stig Engström, also known as the Scandia Man, after his employer, the Scandia Insurance Company, whose headquarters are adjacent to the murder site. In previous accounts, Engström was primarily described as a witness and, according to his own account, the first eyewitness to appear at the murder scene. The police had also briefly investigated him as a suspect, but this investigation was discontinued. Peter Schaar posits that Engström, who had a strong aversion to Palmer and his policies, may have shot Palmer in the street. The crime scene evidence, according to Peter Schaan, firmly implicates Engström as the assassin. Significantly, several witnesses gave descriptions of the fleeing killer that matched Engström, some very closely. No witnesses placed Engström at the scene after the shots, despite Engström's claim to have been present from the beginning, to have spoken with Mrs. Palmer and the police, and to have participated in efforts to resuscitate Palmer. Engstrom's known movements throughout the evening, about which he lied when questioned, indicate he had the opportunity to locate Palmer at the movie theatre earlier that evening and then follow him to the crime scene. Soon after the murder, Engstrom made a succession of media appearances in which he described his involvement in the events in greater detail and criticised the police. As a result of Engstrom's unreliability and inconsistency as a witness, the police quickly classified him as a person of no interest. Petersen argues that Engstrom's media appearances were an opportunistic and successful strategy designed to mislead investigators and garner attention as a crucial witness neglected by the police. According to FBI profiler John Douglas, many killers insert themselves into an investigation to mislead or keep abreast of new breakthroughs in cases. This may have been true for Engstrom's attention-seeking behavior. While Peter Schan's hypothesis is based on circumstantial evidence, he suggests that it may be possible to prove Engstrom's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt by tracing and examining the murder weapon. According to Peter Schan's hypothesis, the revolver was owned by an Engstrom acquaintance who was an ardent gun collector. The Scandia Man thesis was first proposed by Lars Larsen in his 2016 book, The Enemy of the Nation, but it received limited attention at the time. Christer Peter Schaan, an investigator for the Swedish Prosecution Authority, named Engström the prime suspect in Palmer's assassination at a press conference on June 10, 2020. The prosecutor denied using the works of Lars Larsen and Thomas Peter Schaan, but presented a description of the case that was strikingly similar. The investigator's case hinged on the fact that Engstrom was known to have been at or near the crime scene. Still, he had not been positively identified as being present after the shooting by any other witnesses. His own account of events was deemed unreliable, and his clothing resembled that of the murderer. Peter Schant provided no motive for the murder, did not explain how or why Engstrom obtained a firearm or why he would have been carrying it when he left his office that evening, and did not present any witness who positively identified Engstrom as the killer. 
Peter Shaw stated that the circumstantial evidence against Engstrom was insufficient for a trial, but would have been sufficient to detain and interrogate him if he had been alive. As Engstrom was deceased and had taken his own life, the Swedish authorities could not initiate a prosecution, and the investigation ended 34 years after the homicide. Olaf Palmer was not a quiet politician and had many known and unknown enemies worldwide. Conspiracy or lone gunman? What do you think happened in this much debated case? We would love to hear your opinion, so please comment below. If you love our content and want to support the channel, check out our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch from Bad Things.